wanted to um, acknowledge LSU and the College of uh, the Coast Environment for inviting me and hosting me. It's been amazing to talk to undergrad and graduate and postdoc students this morning um, and learn a little bit about what you all are doing. I hope you guys have some great questions for me. And I will get started here. I have a lot to cover, as you might have heard or kind of read from the title, 15 years of character research. So we've got 15 years and about 45 minutes. So let's see if we can get it. All right, so because of how integrated and collaborative this research is, there are a lot of people to thank. And so this is just a list of everyone, um, including Steve and, and some folks um, at UNCW, Davidson, and LSU that have been um, uh, critical in my research uh, on terrapins over the past 15 years. So of course, I wanted to set the stage a young I still consider myself young, but a younger uh, Leanne Hardin here. Uh, this was actually my first time to the East, um, South Carolina coast, um, the coastal environment in Salt Marsh, where I got inspired. And so um, I wanted to kind of give you a, a, a visual of what it looked like um, when I was getting all of my hypotheses flooding through my brain about um, how uh, these species that uh, diamondback terrapins that live in the coast um, along the east and gulf coast of the U.S. how um, they were able to survive and adapt in this really dynamic and kind of harsh environment. And so here I'm actually looking for terrapin heads and um, this was part of the longest uh, running study on diamondback terrapins and still continues to be um, in the world and, um, which is um, I, we kind of say that as a joke just because terrapins are only in the U.S., but um, it had been going on for 38 years now, and so I was lucky enough as a Davidson undergrad to go down to the salt marsh in South Carolina, Kiwa Island specifically, and explore terrapins. You see a saying here, we did get wet and muddy, uh, dragging sayings through the tidal creeks. And so I started to ask a lot of questions about terrapin ecology, physiology, behavior throughout the seasons to try to understand what they're doing. We don't know a lot about them and how we can um, use this information to help protect them. And so from this week-long period that I was exposed to in Davidson, I decided that that's what I wanted to do my graduate research on. Right? I, I took a chance, and this is something I would never recommend an undergrad. I went right in and wrote all of my letters that were terrapin specific, right? Here, I'm going species specific here, and here's all the things I want to explore about them. It worked out okay. I got very lucky in finding a PhD advisor who had just gotten a grant to support terrapin research. So it was a great connection, um, but I was, I was hardcore on terrapins from week one. So I moved to UNCW, um, which is where I did my master's and converted to a PhD because I couldn't possibly answer all my questions in two years of and so I also got, um, it's just kind of a picture of me pulling my first terrapin and exploring, um, some, starting to explore some of the questions about their behavior and how they interacted with their habitat. Okay, so a little bit more about the species that might be new to you. We do have it here on the Louisiana coast, although they're arguably a little bit harder to find than the east uh, coast of the U.S because of the, the systems that the salt marshes here are a little bit um, wider and kind of drain out during low tide. Uh, but they are a coastal estuary species uh, all the way from Cape Cod down to Corpus Christi, Texas. And they are strictly kind of estuary species. They can live in fresh water, they can live in hypersaline environments, but they're only found on the coast. And they um, uh, are typically kind of known as as having this life history where they're non-migratory, they have high site fidelity, um, which um, can mean they're staying in the same creek for their entire life, um, save going out to nest and coming back. And they're also um, quite sexually dimorphic, which is actually a critical um, fact to uh, help uh, protect them from interactions with blue crab fishers, which I'll talk about in a little bit. So here we have a very small adult male in a very large adult female. And um, this, or this uh, sexual dimorphism also allows us to ask questions about um, 
regulating salt and water balance as well uh, because of the big size difference in that. So what they eat um, along these coasts are pretty much our periwinkles, um, our fiddler crabs, and they'll kind of go in and out with the tides. They're semi-aquatic as well, and so they will spend um, almost half their, their life kind of up buried in the mud and then um, come out and as the tides are draining out, um, float along in the tidal creeks. Um, sometimes they're nesting on the backside of the barrier islands. Um, and they might kind of head up rivers a little bit, um, but not too far inland. So it's a little bit about them. And you know, we don't know too much about their, their lifespan, but we have found um, turtles over 40 uh, years old um, documented in the Kiowa River system. And so that's something obviously you can only really learn once you've studied a species long enough um, to figure that out. Um, so a little bit more about kind of my, um, what, where I kind of like to focus my research questions are really about this highly variable environment. Um, so as you may know, if you've been out to the salt marshes here, uh, it is a really dynamic environment. The tidal cycles can be extreme, um, and with that you get a lot of variation in salinity um, from even just tidal cycles, but also seasonal salinity changes as well, and variable temperatures. And so what we, some of the things that we've learned preliminarily with studying terrapins is that they do um, use different habitats depending on uh, the tidal cycles. So they spend some time in the open water and a lot of time in um, the, the mid to high marsh. Um, depending on whether they're feeding or, or reproducing or just trying to uh, thermo or osmo regulate. They're also um, in an environment, of course, that, that has a really wide range in salinity, and they are, and they, of course, they're osmo regulators, right? So they're, the challenge that they have, as kind of I think about them as being like big bags of water floating around in kind of an ocean kind of environment is how can they reduce the amount of salt um, that they intake, right? Or how can they get rid of extra salt? And how can they reduce the amount of water, body water, that they lose to the environment, right? Because they're hypoosmotic regulators, um, they're essentially using their fresh water um, to the salty environment. So the biggest challenge, as you may know if you study fish as well, is um, uh, regulating that, that salt water. And then we have really variable temperatures here. And so this is actually just a trace of um, the, the black lines or a trace of the turtle's temperature, a carapace or top shell temperature, and how it can fluctuate with its environment. So I kind of took all of these ideas about this dynamic environment to ask a lot of my questions um, over the past 15 years. Okay, here's, um, Something that I kind of like to throw in here. This is a little bit of what um, kind of habitats they can be using. Right? It can be pretty hard to find them. Um, here's one popping out of the, the mud here. Um, but lots of questions about um, what habitats are using in different um, time periods of, of uh, their environmental changes. Okay, so with my questions come how does this dynamic environment influence their behavioral ecology? their physiological ecology, and then understanding that there's a relationship between the two, right? So any time that they are choosing to move out of um, the open water and up into the marsh, um, that would change their physiology. And any time they're trying to regulate their their body water uh, and making sure that they are um, they don't essentially take on too much salt or lose too much water, they're having to behaviorally modify their habitat and ultimately, with, with um, species like terrapins that are, are listed um, as a vulnerable species, it's also important to understand how these kinds of questions can ultimately be used as uh, you know, a more of uh, an application to conserve them, right? Or um, inform management decisions um, about their population status. Okay, so just some of the the information that you may not be familiar with in terms of their historical and kind of current status and the, the historical and current threats of terrapins. 
Um, this is a recipe from the, the First Lady of Maryland, um, uh, publishing a paper um, in the early 1900s that was essentially saying you need three terrapins and then, you know, some other stuff to make nice terrapin soup. And terrapin were harvested um, up until very recently, it was really, you were allowed to harvest terrapins on a state-by-state -state, uh, basis, essentially. And so um, they were harvested really heavily before there were any regulations uh, put in place. And so this was kind of the first blow to their populations, was um, large-scale harvesting of terrapins, dragging trawls um, through the bottoms of tidal creeks, pulling up all the terrapins that are overwintering, and taking them off to uh, for harvest. And the more current threats that we are likely are all pretty familiar with are anthropogenic, right? So we have threats associated with habitat uh, use change, habitat loss, and alteration, and also um, you know an increase in human subsidized predators, which we kind of consider are um, things like our raccoons here that are higher in numbers in more urban. Um, they are really good at predating uh, nests, and they essentially are reducing the population before it can even, um, before we can even have things kind of help to recruit in the population. So um, the, the last one here that I'll add is the interaction with the food crab fishery, right? And all of these are really challenging threats to address, uh, particularly when um, there are um, game uh, fisheries uh, that you need to, to essentially interact with and collaborate with to help address the issue. And so with all of these, um, it is a big challenge to try to figure out um, how to, to help conserve their populations. Uh, this is just an example of what a crab pot can do um, to terrapin populations. Uh, this is one crab pot, so a lot of times you know you might find a crab pot with one or two terrapins in here. But um, this one had 133. And predominantly male, because remember that sexual dimorphism, more of the males can get in the traps, and they end up drowning with lack of access to oxygen, particularly in the warmer months when there's less dissolved oxygen in, in the system. And so um, because they're, they have high site fidelity, um, a few crab traps actually can uh, single-handedly um, you know, decimate a, a local population. And so this is a big concern, and it is something that um, crabbers don't want to deal with either, right? You would not want to pull up your trap and have this many dead terrapins in it. So it's something that, you know, ideally we'd like to both be working on a solution to. Okay, and one other thing to kind of note here is with the population declines from the interactions with the crab fisheries, um, it has actually, there's evidence that it shifted um, the population demographics because it has reduced the number of males and juveniles in the population. And so um, typically populations with older females are evidence of um, historical or more recent uh, crab trapping. And this is of course incidental bycatch, not uh, purpose, uh, purposely trapped. Another issue of course that you guys are very well familiar with um, is, um, you know, we have to kind of put this under the umbrella of habitat alteration, um, you know, human news, climate change will be, um, and is, um, reducing terrapin habitat. And this does um, uh, pose some interesting questions also about um, their optimal regulatory capabilities as um, their environments may become um, uh, more hypersaline um, as levels continue to rise. And so throughout um, their range, they are also dealing with potential habitat loss here. Okay, and because of that, this is actually pretty recent that they've been listed as vulnerable. When I started doing research on them, they were, um, it was being pushed to have them listed, but they were just a species of special concern state by state, and they didn't have um, an IUCN written and they do also vary by state. And the regulations also vary by state um, regarding uh, uh, crab trap modifications or potential management areas that are that are prohibited from crab trapping. So it is a 
state by state thing, and um, I'll primarily be talking about the Carolinas because that's where I've done my research. Um, but we can explore more questions about uh, the Louisiana coast um, towards the end of, of the talk. Okay, so we're thinking about um, the behavioral and physio physiological, physiological ecology and the interactions between them. Um, I primarily want to focus on conservation as it relates to reducing these potential interactions with the blue crab fishery. So if we can understand more about the habitats you're using, when they're active, when they're not active, and how physiology might inform those behaviors, we can understand a little bit more about and make more targeted uh, recommendations to uh, the fisheries to reduce these interactions. Okay. So I'll start off with a little of the behavioral ecology. And I'll say um, I'm, I am a uh, statistical analysis light here. If you're interested in um, asking any questions about the analyses, I welcome um, any questions related to that. But I really just wanted to show you um, how my research has kind of moved and progressed from behavioral ecology um, to physiology and then back again to um, conservation questions. So what we do know from terrapins before I started my research was that they had these seasonal um, behavioral changes, right? So we have um, uh, mating courtship behaviors that start in earlier spring. Typically, um, terrapins become active when water temperature reaches about 15 20 C. And so when that occurs, we actually do see terrapins coming out of hibernation and starting to do all the things that animals do once they uh, become active, right? So breeding, nesting, feeding, and using um, this intertidal area um, regularly, depending on the tide. Now, we also notice um, a lot of behaviors that might um, help to uh, dictate their, their body temperature, right? That are thermoregulatory in nature. Um, in winter, and I'll kind of put these as a general, let's say, in the Carolinas, uh, April, um, and they start to, you know, April through October, and they start to hunker down um, in mid-October. So they start to downregulate some of their physiological processes and uh, start to overwinter in the intertidal mud. And this can vary a lot across the coastline, and it's something that I'm really fascinated about for future questions is how their overwintering varies from Cape Cod down to Corpus Christi. But in the Carolinas, it's about from October uh, to mid, uh, April 1 is when they start coming out, around, around 15 C. My study questions or study objectives related to behavioral ecology were focusing on um, asking questions about their seasonal movements uh, that might help to, uh, in the future, inform interactions where, where areas might be at more risk of interacting with, with the blue crab fishery or areas and time periods that are less risky for them to drown in crab pots. And then also using uh, temperature data loggers to dive a little bit uh, at a more fine scale to understand um, their kind of the, the temperature they experience and if we can use that, the temperature data loggers to understand a little bit more about the habitats they're using. So you can kind of think of this as a more labor intense <laughs> way of of researching terrapins and a less labor intense way of researching terrapins. I would also say it's more expensive. Um, you know, radio tags range about $150 to $200 per individual, whereas a temperature data logger, uh, what we consider called an eye button, is about $15. And it is, you know, it is not remote sensing, but if you can collect the turtle at the end, you can get all of that temperature information. And so I'll show you a little bit more about how that works. Okay, so my, here is that labor intensive part, right? My research actually mostly consisted of, and I think I, I did pull schemes out one time uh, when we were doing research, but it, it was mostly myself doing this. <laughs> I don't think I was smiling as much, um, but um, you know, pose for a picture. Um, I essentially tagged about 30 terrapins and put radio transmitters and data loggers on their carapace. Um, 
and those last for a year, and so I was able to track them throughout the season. So I um, actually using, uh, with the help of a local fisherman um, here, we actually caught uh, these terrapins and tagged them in the spring and summer. And these were focused on the south, uh, southeastern part of North Carolina at a few barrier islands. One of these barrier islands is protected. It is a National Estuary Research Reserve. Um, and one of them is a fancy place to live. Um, and so what I also did was put in temperature data loggers into the environment, right? Because you can't really understand um, what kind of habitats you're using if you're only looking at terrapin temperature. But if you can analyze terrapin temperature in relation to water and shallow and deep mud temperature, you can get a better idea of what habitats they're using when you're not out there tracking them. And typically tracking just a handful, let's like say 10 turtles, was a full, full day, probably eight hour day. Um, mostly this is mostly what it looked like actually. This is a little bit more representative of my time spent in the marsh. Um, it was extremely difficult to get around, as, as you may know if you do any research in the marsh. And so I just wanted to share this because uh, this is actually the reality of, of the research that I did. Um, and what kind of goes into um, collecting even just uh, a small data set from 30 individuals. There's a little bit of my behavior ecology there. Okay, so broadly, um, what we found is support some of the um, kind of popular um, data information that you can find in, you know, kind of turtle textbooks about the activity patterns of terrapins. And so what we found here on a monthly basis, uh, what kind of habitats they were using. When they became active, you can see here the very clear distinction between uh, March and April, um, which can be supported with temperature, um, with uh, water temperatures changing and increasing. And then also the addition of their, the habitat use on um, uh, the salt marsh, Whoop. The salt marsh mud. So um, you can actually see here, which was, is pretty um, unsurprising, that they're going to be basking or on the, the mud surface more when there's a big difference between water and air temperature, right? Because they're thermoregulating, but also likely osmoregulating. Taking themselves out of the aquatic environment means that they can reduce the amount of body water they lose and salt that they might. Uh, uh, that might be added to their body through ingestion and foraging. Okay, so um, here we kind of saw some, some broad seasonal variation in their habitat use. And what else did we find? I kind of spared you the, the modeling, so I'll just kind of share the, the bullet points from another study that um, I worked on with some undergrads. Um, the, the temperature uh, data logger supported this behavioral uh, shift. Um, from essentially spring and fall to winter. So there was, of course, a, a monthly, significant monthly variation in, in terrapin temperature, which is TC. Um, and it did differ a little bit between males and females. We did actually find males basking a little bit more um, on the mud surface than females. Um, the terrapin micro habitat use also varied monthly as well, right? So um, what we found is that terrapin temperature and the environment matched closely, and that as predicted, based on um, my radio telemetry results, that we have shallow mud predicting terrapin temperature um, during the winter months, which is when they need wind overwintering in that intertidal uh, mud zone. And also that water temperature has predicted their body temperatures during their active Okay, so we can kind of use both of these to understand a little bit more about um, when they become active. Now, I know this is pretty kind of broad scale, right, instead of monthly level, but what's really important about this is understanding how this may overlap or not with the blue crab fishery, particularly uh, soft shell crab peeler pots that are placed in environments um, around this time in shallow, near shore habitat. We'll come back to that, that's a little teaser, but keep in mind that I'm going to be using this data to help inform um, some of those overlap. 
So next, I want to talk a little bit about um, the physiological ecology. And to understand how much behavior can play a role in their physiology. They're pretty incredible species in that they can, they have physiological strategies to regulate water body, um, their body water flux and, and salt flux through their body, but they also are able to use more evasive strategies like behavioral changes to reduce um, uh, any kind of um, uh, excess salt in their bodies. So terrapins actually, you can kind of see here how they stack up against other species that live in marine environments. And terrapins are unique in that, for turtles at least, they are one of the few vertebrate uh, species that is found exclusively in uh, the salt marsh along the coast. A lot of species use it right, for different periods of their life, different parts of their life cycle, um, but they are not found in it throughout their life. Okay, so they kind of ha um, occupy this unique niche um, along the coastline. And you can see kind of how they stack up with other marine and mangrove species um, in terms of their sodium, their chloride, their potassium regulation. They do have lacrimal salt glands, which are salt glands um, that, that are associated with the eye that allow them to excrete um, excess salts. So they're not quite as good as some of our sea turtles here, right, in terms of what they can excrete. You can obviously see it's pretty low in terms of sodium and potassium compared to others, but they do have a uh, pretty metabolically expensive physi physiological mechanism for getting rid of excess salt. Okay, so they must be, because they're not the best uh, physiological algal regulators, they must be doing some other things, right? So what else do they have going for them? There's some morphological and behavioral strategies that they use. So here we have, um, of course, integument um, that reduces or increases the barrier between the external and internal environment and it reduces some of that water loss from their body. They drink water, so they actually are found, and this is it's kind of cool um, to look back into the old literature. Um, a lot of scientists documented um, them kind of when it starts to rain and seeing a lot of terrapin heads along the surface and it's because they actually drink kind of like that thin water film um, from the rain up on the surface. They're up, they also find uh, on low tide days or periods, um, low tides, uh, when it's raining they find these freshwater puddles and you'll find them in this position kind of hunkered down just drinking as much fresh water as they can. And so they have um, some more behavioral mechanisms as well. Um, they also reduce the amount that they eat because of course um, they're eating isoosmotic prey like our uh, fiddler crabs and, and um, periwinkle snails. And then of course they can choose whether or not they want to be in the water, right? Their semi-aquatic nature allows them to kind of quit when it gets too salty. Okay, so here are just some examples of their behavioral choices, right? And so what I'm interested in is kind of understanding um, these seasonal changes and how they might influence their physiology. So of course, we kind of did two things. We um, did a physiological uh, experimental design in the lab where it was controlled, and we also uh, explored their physiology out in the field. Okay, and also questions about how well can they regulate um, uh, their salt and, and body water when they're pretty inactive, right? And they're dormant. Okay, so what kinds of effects, why is salt water so bad, right? I mean, they're living in this environment, they evolved in this environment to be kind of this intermediate species between fresh and salt. Um, salt, uh, there are well-documented salinity effects on things like growth and metabolism, right? So I'll just point them out briefly here. Of course, we know what they're eating, and they're taking in excess salt that way. Um, but we also know that higher salinity means lower growth rates. Okay? And this has been documented several times in controlled laboratory settings. Um, we do know that they have some capabilities of salt gland activation. Oops, sorry. And we have uh, things like hypophagy or suppressed appetite, 
um, and then increased, it increased uh, changes in their habitat use. So the, the broad goals here, and I'll spend most of the time uh, talking about the lab um, aspects of it, were to investigate the importance of the behavioral versus physiological adjustments um, when terrapins are exposed to different temperatures at different salinities. Right? And um, I'll walk through a little bit of that. We did not explore the physiological mechanisms of things like salt gland activation and function, but we inferred it through their blood biochemistry and body water. And then we went out into the field and actually looked to see how does their blood biochemistry look in the field? Is it different than in a laboratory setting when there's lots of uh, abiotic factors that can be controlled? Okay, so I'll just briefly walk through this setup here. Um, this setup took quite some time. I worked with my PhD advisor on this um, to come up with an experimental design to allow for questions of the interactions between salt and temperature. Okay, so what we did was kind of take an osmotic, uh, isoosmotic environment of about 12 PSUs, um, and it's uh, essentially exposed 15, or, sorry, five and, and six um, terrapins um, in these two environments, temperature environments and, and uh, controlled salt environments, um, to allow them to kind of acclimate in the lab environment. So we put them both in the same salt water uh, level that is similar to their internal salt levels in their body. And then we actually expose them to kind of a typical summer water temperature and typical winter water temperature. We allow them to acclimate for three weeks. And before we introduce them to different experimental um, environments, we took blood samples and we injected them with deuterium to get a measure of body water or body flux um, through their system. So heavy water allows us, uh, isotope, um, heavy water allows us to understand a little bit more about how quickly water is flux through their body um, and also the percentage of their body water. Are they losing a lot of, of their body water? Or are they able to maintain it, right? Which is the idea, right? We don't want them to go through major changes in body water. Okay, so we looked at both total body water and daily water flux. We also looked at their respiration because we wanted to get at questions about metabolism. Then we exposed them or put them in two different environments here where we have kind of the typical full marine 35 PSUs um, for three to five days and at, at 25 degree uh, Celsius and then at 10. And these were two different groups of terrapins. And then we took the same measurements here. Um, we measured the amount of deuterium to see how much had been lost to get an idea of loss of body water um, and then also looked at their respiration. So the hypotheses or the, the predictions here were really that um, we might have uh, changes in, in the body water and then also changes in oxygen consumption. Right? If you are exposed to um, a more marine uh, Salt water system, especially in an active temperature environment, we'd expect um, oxygen consumption to go up as they're kicking up their lacrimal salt gland, um, salt excretion, um, and metabolic activity okay. in both of these environments. So, and then to understand which one is going to be more taxing for them at 25 or at 10. These were all the things that we measured through various forms. We took blood um, from them, the cervical sinus, some of you were interested in that. Um, and then we also injected them with deuterium. And this is just kind of an example of uh, how you can visualize uh, what deuterium can tell you. Um, right? We have deuterium levels in the body and kind of a baseline before it's injected, allowing it to equilibrate and then measuring the washout or how much is lost, how much heavy water is lost in, um, uh, to the environment through all of these processes, right? Increased metabolic rate is going to be, is going to have a relationship with body water flux and loss of deuterium. And then we also measured in a closed system uh, 
respiratory setup, we measured their VO2, so um, their oxygen consumption. We also documented their activity a little bit in here. Um, this is a nice little setup. I think this is a salad bowl on top, so you know you have to get creative in these environments um, with some duct tape um, to uh, essentially create that closed system. Um, briefly here, and then talk about um, some of the concluding thoughts and talk about uh, the physiology. Okay, so what we found was that we kind of look here to see um, the breakdown on the x-axis of the 25. Um, isoosmotic, uh, 25 degree uh, kind of uh, increase salinity, and then the 10, 12, um, 10 degree um, isoosmotic and the 10 degree um, marine system. Okay, and how much um, the osmolality did or did not change. Okay, so plasma osmolality, osmolality, yes, osmolality, wow, okay. plasma osmolality and sodium um, were lower at 25 degrees um, compared to the 10. And, um, and there are some hypotheses about um, relationships with potential water loss there, or kind of making up for that dramatic um, shift to um, an extreme, extremely salt environment. And then we did find also that there were no significant relationships um, of salinity on these areas. So um, you can see here kind of the relationship of salt and chloride comparatively across the different treatment groups. Okay, so I'll show you one more graph here and then we can kind of talk about how temperature was a bigger player, uh, seemed to be a bigger player in their metabolic rates and their osmotic status. So daily water flux and water turnover rates did increase the temperature because that is related to the uh, metabolic rate increasing. And um, daily water flux also did Okay, so an increase in salinity might have meant um, actively, um, whether behavioral, um, trying to reduce the amount of water flux, or behavioral as in removing yourself from the water column, or stopping from eating, stopping ingesting any water, would reduce the water flux in a very salty environment. And then we found that total body water percentage remained stable. So what we can infer there is they were able to maintain their body water um, despite these dramatic changes in the saline environment. We found that, um, as predicted, that metabolic rate is higher. They're cold-blooded, right? They're exotherm, so um, this is uh, expected, an expected relationship. What was somewhat surprising was that there was no um, significant effect of salinity um, on VO2. What we can infer briefly here is that the temperature was a, was a bigger factor, right? It had stronger effects than the salinity in terms of their osmotic status, their water flux, their metabolic rate. Okay, I'm going to read here uh, a little bit more of those details. And something else that's key that we found um, is that the behavioral adjustments might have played a role um, in being a predominant osmoregulatory strategy. When exposed to that adverse saline environment. Okay. So being able to pull themselves out of the water or reduce feeding are both or reduce any ingestion of salt water are big players in behavioral adjustments. And my last kind of objective here, and this is only um, just to kind of show you a little bit of what we did in the field. Uh, primarily what I did in the field is my PhD research. Um, was to see what actually happens when they're out in the environment. Um, now, it was semi kind of uh, controlled environment. We did create that pen, um, uh, coined the Terra pen, um, and it only incurred some damage from a hurricane that we had to rebuild a little bit. And we actually caught turtles from the environment and put them in. And we were asking questions about their osmotic status as the temperature shifted and decreased during the winter. How, a, how well were they able to maintain their osmotic status? Um, and so we kind of constructed this um, semi-controlled environment to ask those questions. Okay, and this is what my field, when I asked the uh, students earlier, are you in the field or in the lab? And some of you were like, I think a little bit of both. 
Uh, I would say both here. This is my lab out in the field. Uh, I am wearing gloves, but you can see it was quite a muddy uh, laboratory set up here on a tarp at low tide, and I used uh, a surfboard to get around. So um, always getting creative. Um, we essentially had 10 females in there, and uh, monthly took blood samples monthly to look at osmotic status. So osmolites primarily. And what we found, I know there's a lot of variability here, the kind of best graphs I could show to represent what are really more complex linear mixed models. Um, but what we found is that the osmotic status did not significantly vary throughout the winter season. So they are able, even at lower temperatures, winter temperatures, they're able to maintain their osmotic status and maintain their body water. And we actually um, documented the shift when they came out of overwintering document the shift in uh, dramatic increase in daily water flux um, through deteriorating as well. Okay. So um, again, this is supporting the behavioral strategies to maintain osmotic uh, pressure. Okay, so how does this all come together to help inform conservation, right? Because essentially what we have here is um, an exploration of what they're doing seasonally, what habitats they're using, what activity patterns they show, we have temperatures that kind of support these findings and also give us an indication of what temperatures they experience on you know, a daily and seasonal basis. Um, but we also have the physiological component showing us that the behavior seems to be the uh, primary uh, strategy, behavioral adjustments, to maintaining their physiological status. Okay, so if you kind of think about how we can pull these in together, Right? I'll show you my last, this actually does include one little model here. This last piece about how I use the spatial data to help actually inform um, when it's most risky or least risky for interactions with crab pots. Okay, so what we have here is what I actually, um, what I didn't tell you earlier was I took GPS coordinates of all of the terrapin locations that I tracked for a year, and I also took any crab pot locations. Okay, so now tampering with the crab pots, I just reported their GPS locations to create a spatial model that we could actually look to see what their overlap looked like, and then incorporate behavior into it. So here are just my two sites. Um, we've got the figure eight island and the Batesboro island. This one is the one that people live on, so this one's a protected island. Um, and kind of exploring this spatial overlap here with a spatial overlap model. And I'll briefly kind of just tell you what incorporates this section, not too complicated. It's really looking at densities of predators and prey. Um, so using a modified predator prey model, crab trap as kind of the sit and wait predator, right? And the prey being the terrapins. So we use the spatial overlap model, it's actually been used looking at sea turtles and eel nets along the southeast coast as well. And we have information here about the parameters, right? But um, ultimately is looking at this, the SOI value, whether it is greater, equal to, or less than one. Equal to one means there's, you know, that there, the risk is um, essentially kind of a neutral risk here. Uh, less than one is a lower risk, because lower spatial overlap. And greater than one is a greater uh, overlap um, and greater risk of interaction terrapins and crab pot fisheries. Okay. The next component is kind of thinking about um, uh, calculating the density of risk, which really just means looking at that spatial overlap index and incorporating the predator density um, or the crab pot density here into the model. So we can map this out and take a look at, you can probably infer even without the SOI numbers, which looks a little bit more risky, right? Where there's more interaction. But here we have um, kind of high levels um, of SOI and figure eight during the active and dormant season. Okay, one of them is a little bit more relevant because we know during the dormant season that characters are not going to be interacting with crab pots that much. And we can also look at mason burrow during the active season. The SOI is zero and a little bit higher 
great rule to see because again, we need really not to grow this. So how do we incorporate what we know about their behavior, seasonally, into this model? Okay. We can actually simply put in the proportion of time that they are active um, in the water column versus up in, in the, mud, the marsh mud and incorporate that into the model. Right, so the bycatch risk is a factor of the sensitive risk and then including the behavioral proportion that they might be actually interacting with crab in the water. And here are just the numbers. What's important likely is kind of looking at the black bars, right? Um, during the active season, the proportion of time that they're swimming in the water that potentially interacting with crab is much higher. And in the growing season, it's lower, and we also know they're mostly buried in the mud in, in the winter time. So about 63% of the time they, they were documented swimming, and um, at think a little bit more, 84% um, of the time they were documented swimming in um, kind of the open water. Okay, so we build this in, and this is the one figure, or one table I'll show you that has both numbers coming up. Um, just keep in mind, we looked at the SOI, right, and then we want to essentially look to see how the behavior fit into that model. Does it reduce the bycatch risk because they're dormant or because they're in the mud, or does it increase the by increase bycatch risk? Okay, so here again are those SOI numbers that we looked at, right? And just a reminder, uh, higher than one means higher overlap than expected, um, and potentially more risky. But then we throw in the behavioral part, right? And we do have a reduction. Um, we essentially kind of um, take the density risk and multiply it by the behavior. And um, we have a reduction here, but it's important to kind of keep in, note, uh, keep in mind um, that um, the BR, the bycatch risk, essentially is going to be higher during the active season, which seems Pretty intuitive, right? Um, so um, the other thing to note is the difference between these two sites, Figure 8 and, and Mesa Pearl Island, and how much the bycatch risk, um, how much higher the bycatch risk is in those places that there is high overlap and also high, uh, you know, proportional swimming in nature. The last part was really just any time I saw, not tampering with, but any time I saw a crab pot that had a turban in it. Um, it was documented at Figure 8 Island during the active season. And typically, this is just kind of to show where a lot of the um, bycatch was, right? Are there bycatch? And also, uh, Division of Marine Fisheries provided some data on bycatch as well. Overall, what, we, what is supported also by other literature is the bycatch risk is highest, of course, in the active season but also in shallower uh, places where crab pots are in shallower water and closer to shore. Right? So when we're thinking about that peeler season, where they put peeler pot, where uh, fisheries, uh, food crab fisheries, fishermen put peeler pot along the edges of the coastline, um, of these salt marshes, and also in shallower waters, which is where you're more likely to catch the top shell crabs, is also places that there's the highest bycatch. So what has happened since I collected this data? Because I did leave this, this sadly, this this out piece and moved to the Midwest. So I was hoping other people would help the collect, continue to collect data to help inform more um, conservation management decisions. Um, there's a big uh, citizen science team that actually does headcount surveys. So not as intensive as sailing and walking through the mud, radio tracking turtles, but documenting. Uh, heads on the surfaces of tidal creeks um, and trying to get an idea of population density, or the relative abundance and presence and absence of terrapins. Because keep in mind, I only did one little cove area of Mason Borough. Um, it was important to understand what the rest of some of these bare islands look like, not just one tidal creek area. So here we have crab pots and terrapins documented after the year I left um, through um, 
citizen science through uh, the National Engineering Research Reserve. Kind of Magnuson helped to kind of fill in gaps here. And Division of Marine Fisheries actually also provided some more uh, broad scale data to understand the potential interactions of crab pots and, and terrapins along uh, the southeast coast of North Carolina, particularly Ballhead and Mason Grove, and then also in the Cape Fear River, which really hadn't been sampled much in terms of diamondback terrapins. Um, so they helped to kind of broaden the scope here of these interactions. Uh, and this just kind of shows you the potential interaction zone using the, sh the shallow uh, crab trap placement close to shore. Because we all know at this point, right, there's a lot of evidence to show that that's the riskiest area. Okay, so since then, and this actually just happened in the last year, uh, Division of Marine Fisheries has um, essentially modified their management plan um, to include some more of this information that um, a lot of researchers and citizen scientists have collected. And they propose the following changes. There is a proposed management area at Boston Island where there's lots of potential overlap and documented uh, bycatch uh, drownings and also along the Mason Burrow um, salt, marsh, um, salt marshes on the back side here. So right now what is um, going into place are these diamondback terrapin management areas that are restricted to crabbing in these really shallow areas and close to shore um, uh, places during um, the, the time period that we know they're active, right, essentially, the April through October. Okay, this was actually just signed in uh, 2021 um, as a proclamation to implement these management areas and also um, to introduce BRD or what are um, uh, these bycatch reduction devices that are placed on crab traps. And these are actually used in other states along the coast um, to reduce uh, terrapins from entering um, by taking what we know about the morphology and the sexual dimorphism of uh, these terrapins and creating um, a narrower place for uh, that terrapin to camp and start to get into. So these are, um, and I, you know, these are essentially being implemented from March through October um, to reduce these uh, bycatch incidents. So I'll just kind of leave with a meme here. I feel like I'm not too old that I can't make a meme, right? How it started and how it's going. And these are all the terrapin clubs that have been put out through my undergrad, my grad, with Steve. And you might notice Steve is on three of these um, and has helped tremendously with, so he, I'll give him all the stats and questions. Um, he's helped tremendously in terms of making sense of a lot of this data that we've collected over the years. Um, and I will say, you know, a great thanks to him who has invited me here today to talk with you all. Um, and just kind of a plug for if you in, in graduate school or, or an undergrad, if you find someone um, that enjoys mediocre all you can eat buffets and also loves to run stats and likes collaboration, definitely maintain that relationship because it's been a very fruitful one and it's the reason I'm here today. So um, with that, I will take any questions and thank you so much for your time.